Good afternoon, everybody. I want to thank uh, everybody who uh, joined us on the call today. Uh, really excited to have you on for uh, our session. I'm really excited about both speakers, actually. This is Mike Lewis, I'm the Vice President of Marketing and Awareness. Um, I'm really excited about both speakers that we have on the line today. Uh, both David Carter and Dana Bowler are uh, going to give a great presentation. I had a chance to look at the slides earlier today, and they're just terrific, and we were just on a practice session kind of walking through some of the things that we're going to talk about. And I think you're going to get a lot of value out of today's session. It's just a really cool one that uh, the topic that I don't think we've had the opportunity to talk about yet as part of our series, but, but this one's a great one. So I'm really excited about it. Before I get going, before I turn the uh, pass the ball over to Dana and, and Dave, uh, I'd just like to cover some real quick logistical stuff with you. Uh, first of all, if you have any questions at all, we encourage you to ask as many questions as you'd like throughout the session. And there's two ways you can do it. One is um, is kind of the basic way through WebEx, and that's to use either the chat or the Q&A feature uh, located on the right-hand side of the uh, of the interface here with WebEx. Uh, and if you just type in any questions, we'll be monitoring during the event, and we'll try to get to as many of them as possible as we go forward. The other way to do it is if you are on Twitter, uh, feel free to start a conversation, uh, start a dialogue with other people who are on the line with us today uh, by using the hashtag pound awareness link uh, for any of the tweets that you're submitting. And if you have any questions, feel free, feel free to submit them through Twitter, and we'll be sure to be monitoring Twitter throughout the session as well and get to as many of those questions as possible as we go forward. If you do have any technical issues, uh, please contact WebEx customer service throughout the call. So if anything happens on your end that you're not sure about, please feel free to give uh, WebEx a call, and uh, they'll be able to work that out for you. So before I go uh, and introduce today's speakers, I'd like to just give a quick background on awareness for those of you that don't know who we are and what we do. Uh, real quickly, we're a social media platform company, and really what we did was grow out of, of, of starting as a content management and blogging platform. In fact, uh, back in the, the first first of wave report that came out on blogging platforms, uh, awareness was up in the upper right-hand corner. We, we had a great market there, and we, just, we, we were talking to our customers and realized that what they were looking for was to get out and do more on social media. They wanted to create more communities online. They wanted a better way to engage with their customers, increase their awareness, no pun intended, and build their brand. And so we grew from an early leader to someone who's now working with some uh, really big brand name organizations, powering, their, powering multiple communities for these, for these companies, organizations like McDonald's, Kodak, Marriott, uh, Sony, JetBlue, uh, CVS, uh, a whole host of, of some of the biggest organizations uh, in the world, really, are using awareness to, to power their online communities. The other thing that we noticed as we were collecting registrations for today is that a lot of the folks on the line are actually dialing in from marketing and advertising agencies. And we thought it was important just to highlight the fact that we are, uh, they're, they're actually a deep, uh, we have a lot of deep relationships with agencies around the country and have worked with uh, some of the leaders in the space to drive communities for their customers. And what's great about our relationships with these agencies is we give them access to our platform to deploy to their customers, make it very simple, very easy to do, uh, in a way that they can get things up and running incredibly quickly for all their customers. So we do have a deep relationship with a lot of agencies, and we are starting to establish partnerships with additional agencies. So if you're on the line uh, from a marketing agency, one that maybe we haven't worked with or talked to yet, we'd love to hear from you. You can feel free to contact myself, uh, mike.lewis at awarenessnetwork.com, or get in touch with me on Twitter. And I sit on Boston Mike, so feel free to uh, drop me a note. We'd love to talk to you a little bit more about how we work with agencies. So with that, I'm going to turn things over to Dave Carter and, and Dana. But before I do, I'd like to just give a quick introduction on both. Uh, Dave actually is our CTO and co-founder here. He actually was one of the uh, one of the guys who started this company um, back when we first went to market with uh, with the social media platform. And originally, Dave came to us from. Uh, web cards, which was acquired by Awareness back in March of 2003. And prior to joining, prior to starting web cards, he was at Microsoft for eons, and that's all I'm going to say. Not even going to say a lot of years, it was just a, a ton of years. He held a bunch of different positions, everything from internet strategy, uh, marketing manager, content management, e-commerce positions, uh, and janitor. janitor. He was actually a cafeteria guy, maybe yeah. at one point. It was amazing. Um, but his last role was at the Internet, as the Internet Strategy Manager, where he, he built out Microsoft.com and, and Microsoft Canada in front uh, So we're, we're really happy to have him on the line. I'm sure you're going to get a lot from what Dave talked about today. 
And we also have Dana Ball on the line. And Dana has over nine years' experience in group collaboration and online methods to increase your team and learner engagement. She has a master's degree in conflict resolution, identifies with the human side of change, and works to develop countermeasures that minimize the people risk of implementation. Strong background in implementing e-learning deployment, integrating strategy into current organizational practices. And prior to joining Cisco, uh, Cisco WebEx, sorry, uh, Dana led the first ever national accreditation initiative for the corp for a corporate university for top five global consumer package goods manufacturers. Uh, she's, at, she's active in the learning and facilitating community and is the vice president of professional development program for AFTDs, that's the American Society of Training and Development, the Rocky Mountain chapter. So we're really excited to have Dana on the line as well. Dana, Dave, welcome. Great. Thanks a lot, Mike. Okay, the, first question, the first question that just came in was, uh, and, and that's what we'll answer them all real time, but uh, do we host the application and data internally? And uh, I actually pulled this slide up to the front because it's a question we get a lot where we'll describe social media and the things you can do with it. And then, you know, someone will say, but I don't quite get it. What exactly do you guys do? So in this case, we don't host just what's in the heart. We are first and foremost a technology platform company. So we are a social media marketing platform that people use to deploy their social media communities. Everything we do is hosted. The data is all hosted at our data center. Of course, our contracts say that the customers own all the data. So we're not like a public consumer-facing site where we own all the data. These are, these are totally branded communities um, with different social media use cases. I'll talk about some of those. We do offer services, and we can do best practice guidance. Sometimes we, we do that through uh, an agency. Sometimes we do it directly. But we never do those things on their own. So we would never help someone formulate a social media strategy if they weren't going to be a client of our technology platform. And that's just what we've chosen to focus on. Now, we use the term synchronous and asynchronous, so I thought I would make sure I, I clear it up in case people aren't sure what we were, we're talking about. Um, asynchronous is, is what all the buzz is about, you know, things like discussion forums and all this content that you can access any time of day and you can slice and dice it any way you want. So if we were looking at a community, you could browse the content chronologically, you could browse it by topic, by tag, you could look at the author view, maybe that's a blog, you can even look at voting and check it out via popularity. But in essence, the viewer controls what and when they view. You can get up in the middle of the night, respond to a comment that someone left it, you know, a couple of days before. And that's very different than live events like we've got right now. So you're listening to this event live, it's going to follow a timeline. You can't go back in time and listen to something else until we save it as a recording and you can access it asynchronously. Um, so it's always moving forward. Uh, you know, think of all these live events or listen to a song. Those things all start at one point and continue on until they're done. And of course, these are uh, inherent, inherently live events. Now, some people talk about that like synchronous is old school and asynchronous is new school. And what we're going to really talk about today is the fact that there's a place for both. There's a place to leverage the excitement of live interaction going on right this second, live questions. Because people are definitely more engaged when they're involved in a crowd of people. And that's why things like chat still live on and live streaming and all kinds of things like that. Okay, the other thing I like to whoops, jump too far ahead. The other thing I like to emphasize is I, I love social media. I think it's an amazing way to get in touch with your customers. I don't think I'm on the side of social media that says nothing else matters. Social media is the new, latest, and greatest thing. So if you're trying to get in touch with your customer, abandon everything else and use social media. I haven't gone that far, and I don't think I ever will, because I've seen all kinds of traditional media not get displaced. Um, just share the table with somebody else. So I think social media has a seat at the table, but how you communicate is still going to follow some things like traditional, you know, traditional marketing methods, whether that's direct marketing or brand marketing or email. Um, you know, so there's all kinds of things that are still going to coexist, and that's probably the key to success is making sure they coexist. And again, that really follows our theme today of, you know, synchronous versus uh, asynchronous. In fact, we probably really uh, shouldn't call it versus because we've already sort of made it adversarial by even referring to it that way. The other thing is, you know, we've got to keep in mind we're talking about business problems. We're talking about how to engage people, how to talk to customers, and we have to stop talking about it 
with respect to the tactic. So instead of saying, hey, we're going to do some social media in our company, we have to say, hey, we're going to get an enthusiast community together because we're trying to stimulate passion. Or, hey, we need a peer support community so that people can help each other online. As soon as you just start talk, talking about the tactic as if that's the business problem, then you get all this pushback that says, you know, you can't measure social media. I would say you're right, you can't measure social media unless you apply a use case to it. If you're talking to someone in the ad industry, you, you, you can't say, you know, how would you measure TV or can you measure TV? Well, what's the campaign? And the example I even use is, what's the, what's the return on investment of your car? Well, it depends. Are you driving up to work? Are you delivering things? Are you a taxi cab? So treat social media the exact same way. Think business. It's just a tactic inside business. And, and that's how we think of it. In fact, we've built out these eight social media marketing use cases. And that's how we deploy our product now moving forward is we really try to get customers to focus in on one of those use cases because we can already talk about the business benefits of those and the return on investment of those. We've got customers that sort of span all of those and we've got other webinars that we'll focus in more detail on that. Um, but when you do talk about the social media use cases uh, as, as separate use cases, then you can say, here's how I'd measure that if I was you. And that's exactly what we've done with our application. So, for example, if you've got a corporate voice community, you can measure things like page views because it's kind of a media asset. You're not going to measure page views of a peer support community as being your big indicator because, you know, that may just indicate that people aren't finding the information that they want and they're clicking all over the place, generating lots of, um, lots of, uh, you know, frustration, so your page view numbers will be high. So you might measure, uh, you know, questions versus uh, answers, open, open answers. Uh, I do want to remind you, too, that uh, if, if you're asking any questions in Twitter, because uh, a few things have come through, we, we already set up a hashtag, which is Pound Awareness Inc., I-N-C. So feel free to use that, and uh, Mike's watching a few of those. So we see these use cases we're talking about here as being sort of standard uses people have had with uh, social media, and certainly, you know, with our customers, that's how it's worked out. Now, again, we sort of all have always referred to this as adversarial, you know, synchronous versus asynchronous, and traditional marketing was always sort of this kind of synchronous thing, and that it was a brand speaking out to the customer, and there was never really much conversation coming back. And while that's been very successful, you can't deny that people aren't successful with some of these great TV campaigns. It tends to focus on the first part of the customer life cycle, which is awareness, consideration, and trial. It doesn't focus on adoption, loyalty, and referral. Yet, if you talk to marketers, the utopian state for your customer to be in would be referral. That is, they're telling all their friends to run out and buy this product. But practically, all the old school sort of tactics never targeted that. So it's really, in the past, hasn't been the job of marketing to actually worry about, you know, retention of the customer. It's really just get the customer. Now with social media marketing, um, we can really attack the entire customer life cycle. When you look at the tactics we have today to do that, and again, we're going to show you a great example of that with, um, with, with, with WebEx today, but it becomes a two-way dialogue, and it becomes a two-way dialogue synchronously uh, in live events or asynchronously through you know, discussion forums and all kinds of things. And the nice thing is, asynchronously, it's a lot easier to not be... Um, in the conversation 24-7. You can drop in and out of the conversation. You can sort of a little bit. There's all kinds of things that you can do. But the other cool thing is we're learning about the customer while they participate. So when you participate, I know, um, what, you know what things you participated in, so I learn a little bit about you. You're probably going to fill out a profile. And that's kind of what this comes down to. Um, you know, social media is great. It's a nice, big, warm hug with your customer. That's not business. If you're doing social media uh, for your company, you, you need to be in love with the data that you're going to get back out of it. You need to believe that this is important information that you're going to gather. And there's important information with respect to the explicit customer information. So things are going to write in the, inside their profile. I'm from Toronto, or my favorite sports team is this, or my shoe size is whatever. Those are things I'm going to tell you. You're also going to learn how often I log in, how engaged I am. But then there's going to be the implicit customer information, like, you know, what topics are people getting engaged by in our community? What is, um, you know, what are they commenting, voting, and, and rating inside the system? That tells me as much about the person as what they put in the profile. I may say I'm not interested in politics, but then you notice that I'm only commenting on political posts. And there's also some implicit information that's now coming out more on who your friends are 
And I had you know, a bunch of uh, friends ask me if I moved to Boston, and I said, well, no, but I'm there every week because, you know, I had offices there. And really what they had done was they had looked at, you know, who I was friending and the people commenting uh, on my Facebook page, and they sort of started to imply that maybe I was in Boston more and I must have moved there. So as marketers, that's a level of detail that we need to know when, when we're dialoguing with our customers. I wouldn't be offended by an ad for a Boston-based product because I'm here that often, even though it's... You know, my Facebook, for example, it says uh, Toronto. And, of course, you know, it, uh, the, the idea of having a community is having an ongoing dialogue that you can get in and out of anytime you want when you're trying to talk to the customer. So if there's always a, a community on Simmer, then you can go and engage people different ways as you need to. You know, the example we use is our, our client McDonald's when um, – the Super Size Me documentary came out, they needed a way to respond. Way back then, they didn't have any communities that responded to the press release. But we know how fast that moves, not, not at all. Now they've got a whole bunch of different options. Now, before I turn it over to Dana, I want to talk about what I think makes you know, communities successful. And you know, the first thing is, uh, it sounds like a cliche now, but if you build it, they don't necessarily come. Of course, we all say that. And you can't you can't do that. You can't just build a community and then sit back. You absolutely have to participate in your community and reevaluate the community and, and figure out culturally what moves that community. You, as someone who's created the community, need to actually know why you did it. And as dumb as that sounds, there are so many people that just know they've got to get into social media and they don't know why. If you don't know why, wait and think about it. Go back to the slide that was the social media use cases and figure out what business problem you're trying to attack. Because the problem with not having first community goals is you don't know if you're, if you're successful. So if you don't know what you're trying to do to, to achieve, you're not going to know if you're winning or not. Another big one is mapping the community to the culture of the people that you're targeting. So you're going to have a culture of people that behave one way. Don't try to swim upstream and have you know, your community behave the exact opposite. And I'll, I'll give you a great example of this. Uh, so we do this internet for McDonald's. And uh, a, a subtle thing we did was, in the profile, we, we asked them whether they're an own, a restaurant owner operator or a vendor or head office, because all those people, you know, did, did completely different roles. So that's actually part of the profile. The other thing we did was we asked them what country they're from, and everything they do, we show their country flag as well as their avatar. That's hugely important in a culture like McDonald's, because all the subsidiaries are very competitive amongst each other. And we actually had a best practice section we put up on the site, and you could tell that the Italian subsidiary had jumped on board really quickly because, you know, the first day, all the posts had this Italian flag on it. Well, culturally, that shows that other subsidiary is nuts, and they got in and started posting content, too, because it became a bit of a, you know, the standard competitive flair that goes on among subsidiaries. So that was a little cultural nuance that we made sure we baked into the site. Um, so, you know, think about that and what you can do. Um, because you can ask any profile questions doesn't mean you have to. Ask relevant profile questions. Don't ask me political questions if it's not a political site. If it's a site about shoes, I'm probably cool if you ask me my shoe size. But otherwise, you know, why would you? And the same that applies for conversation topics. You know, create topics that are relevant to the kind of community you're, you're, you're doing. Now, the other, what I think is the most important one is don't treat the community like it's a whole separate thing in your business or your company or your culture as being... Another thing, think about what points of enthusiasm are going to go on in the real-world culture that you can leverage to bring buzz into the community. That's what we're talking about today, right? Take a live event and use it as a way to create buzz in your community. But I will give you another example. Um, that is the McDonald's example, and I'm, it's actually making me a little bit hungry. But anyway, um, when McDonald's did this big conference, they have this registration form you have to fill out to go to this conference for all the restaurant owner operators and staff. And we were having a hard time getting people to fill out their profile. So what we said is, you know, this is a huge point of enthusiasm for the entire business. Why don't we have a profile edit form that is actually the registration form for this conference? Because people have to fill it out. If they want to go to the conference, they have to fill it out. And overnight, the site blooms. Because overnight, people had to fill out their, their um, registration form, check off a little box that says, is it okay if we update your profile with this information? And then, in fact, in that case, we actually put... Um, a uh, question at the bottom that says, um, would, would you like to share our best practice? And that's actually when we introduce um, that, the, the flag part, too. So there's just, you know, a ton of uh, examples like that where you take uh, a point of enthusiasm and you, you harness that energy uh, into the company. 
So these synchronous events we're just about to talk about are great points of enthusiasm. So, um, you know, live events, maybe there's, uh, you know, someone asked a question, and we'll cover it in a bit, about great customer service examples. I think if you saw uh, a whole bunch of the same customer service examples coming up over and over again, that's when you might say, let's do a live event to demonstrate something. Let's do a live event to share how easy this is to do or what where the feature is and sort of, you know, take the energy of that backlog of questions and turn it back on the community and do it live and, you know, kind of harness them to that. There's all kinds of tools and things that we can do and, and again, just things like the customer and, and make it cultural. Now, before I go any further, um, I'll give you an example of how we might weave that into a community. Now, I just took an existing customer, um, constant contact. They don't do this. I just mock this up in Photoshop. But, you know, we always share the asset after the end of the presentation. We'll share this, um, the video or the PowerPoint. And I thought, how can we take that further? Because, you know, we don't necessarily uh, do as much uh, taking advantage of it. So I thought, well, you probably want to take the excitement of when the event's going to occur. Why don't we take that into the site so that there's now a countdown timer? So if there's a live event coming, anybody browsing the community should be able to see that. How can we mock up here? It would be a great way to sort of draw the energy of the actual live event. And then maybe just before the live event, we actually maybe hijack the screen. Because we can do that now in the community, and just like we would play an ad, why don't we play a screen that says, hey, we're just about to start our live event. And, you know, we know from our marketing reports that there's people on our website right now. We really should have had something pop up to say, hey, stop reading our site. Come and listen to us live because we're over here. Uh, and then if, if they're not going to listen to it, make sure we, of course, give them lots of ways to share that through, you know, uh, share this or other vehicles so that this can be syndicated out on other social media networks and then take us, you know, to the live event. After the live event, let's make sure that that asset stays on our site because now we can deal with it asynchronously and we could, you know, ask questions about it and comment on it and vote on it and all kinds of things. Um, so let me let me reintroduce Dana, but sort of explain again how we, we came to do this seminar. I've sat in on a couple of sessions with the folks at Cisco WebEx, and I've always been impressed with not only the notion of using WebEx, because I'm certainly a believer there in terms of live webinars, but the way um, you know the WebEx folks have tools and methods to really engage the audience and really use WebEx way beyond, you know, what we do here from just sharing our desktop. So I really thought if we're going to talk about the merging of synchronous versus asynchronous that, you know, Dana was the right person to do it. And so I'm happy to introduce Dana Bowler, who is a collaboration consultant with Cisco WebEx. And I will pass her the ball. Dana? Thanks, David. Yes. Um, welcome, everyone. You know, it is really interesting, right? So um, you, you've got this community that you're nurturing and um, you're building uh, opportunities to leverage those points of enthusiasm like David discussed before. And what I'm going to talk about today is um, helping you take it to that next step. So um, it's not just about live synchronous events, but it's, it's about transitioning from um, how you learn about your customer to learning with your customer. You can use facilitation um, discussions, real-time facilitation discussions, to develop outcomes so that you can learn with all of the um, important uh, agenda items or, or topics that are abuzz within your community so that you can um, take all of that information or those points of enthusiasm back and, and um, make changes or continue to do what you're doing because it's working so well within your community and within um, your customer base, if you will. So, um, great. Here's what we're going to talk about today. I'm going to, I'm going to kind of start with uh, an importance of real-time discussions, facilitated discussions. Why are they important? How might you structure them with selecting a focus topic? How you might build engaging conversations using tools like WebEx with some types of methods um, for facilitating that dialogue um, with your customers and with your community. And then, once you have this real-time synchronous event, how do you weave that back into your community experience, right? What happens after the fact? So I, I really liked um, what Mike said in the beginning where, when he said, um, you know, there's this whole old school mentality and the new school mentality of synchronous and asynchronous. And, and um, David talked about it a little bit, too. And um, really what we're looking for is a blend of it, right? It's not to replace anything that you're already doing or moving towards. It's all about identifying those blends that you can um, leverage both asynchronous and synchronous time. So let's jump in and, and talk about the importance of facilitated discussion. 
So real-time discussions are all about that um, supplementing the asynchronous experience of your community. It, it brings the ties one step closer to uh, a face-to-face -face interaction time, if you will. You know, think about the traditional definition of a community, right? It's not just about forums, soapboxes, accessing information, hearing from your fellow members. Community is also about events. It's about getting together live to dialogue and deliberate on issues that are important to you, the community. And in the social media context, it's interesting because community is not just your audience, right, or customers in, in, in some cases. It really is a blend of um, the blend of experience of the culture for how you treat um, each other. So it becomes this blend of you, your organization, and your community. So um, real-time discussions can help spark um, and focus discussions on hot topics that are within your community. And um, if you, as the organization, demonstrate your um, commitment and acknowledgement of hearing the voice of your customer, you know, um, someone here in today's event asked, well, you know, how do I, how do I determine or how do I decide um, what kinds of things I should get involved with? How do I decide when to get involved, right? So if you've got some kind of hot topic that's going on and starting to create a buzz within your community, um, if you focus on that and determine that, hey, we need some face time and we need to talk about this with our customers, um, you can do that in real-time facilitated discussions. And th the outcome of that is um, that it, it's key for building connectedness, trust, engagement, and loyalty. And then on the back end, it helps your community of customers acknowledge and commit um, to your brand in return. So um, just like what uh, David said earlier, you know, the, the second half of, of what marketers are looking for is to move those customers into the phases of adoption, loyalty, and referral, right? So you can help through facilitated live events to drive acknowledgement and commitment sometimes in your most, um, you know, some of your biggest either fans or um, the opposite of that, right, enemies who are, are posting within your community. You can turn them into fans through using real-time facilitated discussion, which can help redirect and, and um, reset the tone of the community. So if you've got some kind of hot topic that um, is a, potentially a PR yellow light or red light, you can use a real-time discussion um, to be able to redirect that tone and um, build some kind of celebration out of it. So let's talk about facilitators. <laughs> facilitators, or someone who's a third party, who's not um, particularly involved in the outcome or the interest of what the content is for uh, the real-time facilitated discussion, can help a lot, right? Uh, facilitators, just like they are hired to help drive meetings and negotiations, facilitators help focus a group dynamic and create a container for a, a real-time facilitated discussion event, if you will. So that container creates a space that is welcoming, focused, and productive, right? The ultimate goal of a real-time facilitated discussion is all about getting to some kind of resolve, right? It's all about having at the end participants saying, hey, that was time well spent. I got something out of this. And then ultimately, then going back in and, and having them post um, their, the benefits of, of the discussion or the resolve of um, what, whatever that hot topic was. So facilitators help create group dynamic convergence as well. So it brings individuals together um, that through this punctuated point in time, they become a group. They actually become a team that's talking about a specific topic that's important to all of them. Right, and so um, it's really helpful to have that facilitator uh, role involved in, in, in your discussions. Hey, Dana. I think yeah. there's, a, there's a, a lot of great examples where this would have been helpful in social media. I think when you look at some of these um, PR issues that are spinning wildly out of control, entirely driven by, you know, input from other people and sometimes even misinformed, I think this case is like, like that, that if someone had stepped in and said, oh, yeah, we're going to tell you exactly what's going on and what our plan is, 
live click here versus trying to get your you know your conversation into the thread that's already happening going on. I think you know like you said that being able to punctuate at, at that moment in time with a facilitator to kind of bring the will bring the crowd to a level of calmness or a level of you know informity that I, I think you know that's what people haven't done in the past for sure. David, absolutely. You know it's interesting, right? If you take um, if you take something that's asynchronous and push it into a synchronous environment, it removes the anonymity of it, right? And it builds the interaction and, and demonstrates accountability from both um, the people who post it, right, if they attend, and the organization. So absolutely, it, it punctuates that experience and, and is able to immediately redirect or reset the tone. Right. Great. So... The importance of real, real-time facilitated discussion versus webinar presentations, and I've got the verses here because they are a little bit different, right? Um, right now, we're, we're sitting in a webinar, and we're doing a webinar, webinar presentation. David and I are presenting content and not quite having a facilitated dialogue with you. Of course, we can answer questions. We can kind of read what, um, what, the, what people are asking about, what, what it is that we're talking about, but I don't get to hear your voice. So I can field, field your question, but I don't get to hear um, your particular insight or tone or any part of that, of that discussion. It's, it's very much one way, right? There isn't, um, we're, we're not converging here together. So a real-time facilitated event looks very different from a webinar structure. It has some of the same components, but it's structured. The methods or models that you use with inside, the, um, inside the context of say, uh, a, a web conferencing or event conferencing tool like Cisco WebEx looks a little bit different. You actually structure it differently, right? So um, here's an example. So um, in real-time facilitated discussion, everyone becomes an active participant. Everyone's voice is heard within the, the event, if you will. You get to express your feeling and your, um, your own interpretation regarding the focus topic. If you have a facilitator who is um, is facilitating the discussion, the parameters are held by the facilitator. So, for example, um, that facilitator gets to set the rules of the game, but the audience gets to be the athlete, right? There's no – and here's the difference, right? In a, in a webinar, there's uh, two sides, right? There's presenter. We actually are panelists up here in our participant panel at the top right, and everybody else is an attendee. In a facilitated discussion, everyone becomes a participant. There is no differentiation between who's the speaker and who's the listener. Okay, so the, it, it, it balances equal footing for all involved. Dana, okay, a great question that came in on Twitter was, you know, do you see press conferences moving towards the way of a facilitated discussion? I think that's a great example because, you know, press conference isn't like a huge webinar where we're just speaking. If you can actually make it interactive, I think, you know, like you said, you'll come to Resolve, which and Resolve might be, you know, really getting people to understand what the product announcement is or, or whatever that PR is. Absolutely. That's a great point. I think that that's one, one area where you might be able to use a, a facilitated discussion and, and change the experience of the press conference. Great one. What, what do you think the, the, the numbers or, or size of audience is where it becomes – uh, ineffective. I mean, traditionally we, and, and this is where I come, and I'm happy to have you on the line because, you know, we do WebExes all the time and we don't use it, but traditionally when we get up into a couple hundred people, we, you know, we really only take questions by chat. Um, what sort of numbers do you guys recommend when, when you're trying to do a really facilitated but very engaged? Yeah, good question. You know, a, a really facilitated and engaged um, type of discussion, I, I would suggest starting out small. Right, so, you know, I, I actually in my slides, in it, uh, coming up here, I, I talk about having a group of 25 or less. When you're starting out, I would say, you know, make that group even smaller. Right. And what's interesting about it is that you can use that almost as a marketing spin, right? So if you have a facilitated discussion and you open the invitation, you can invite the um, participants in by saying that there's limited um, seating available or limited participant availability. So it almost becomes that VIP, hey, get in, um, you know, sign up quickly or else your chance is going to be gone. So, and, 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 you know, in the real world, we just call that a focus group, and we'd be doing it to understand the culture of the customer, which is exactly what we think we need to do before we go large on some of these topics anyway. So I think that notion is great. If you have a giant community, it's not that you have to have a conversation with all of them, but to get, you know, a group of people together 
to have a discussion, but to leave behind an asset that could be discussed by the larger group later too, I think is really valuable. Absolutely, and it's 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 very similar to a focus group, but a little different, right? Because um, the focus group, you want to make sure that there's a lot of parameters that you set to make sure that you're getting equal representation across. Right, so that's what the facilitation group. That's yeah, where you have to have a program, right? Right. So. Right. No, you, you would have to have a facilitator, and you would have to have um, you would have to open the invite to people who are are um, have the enthusiasm or, or uh, want to participate. So it wouldn't be you reaching out to them; it would be them signing up, um, you know, on their own because you've invited the you know the entire group or the entire community who's who's discussing X, Y, or Z in the in, in their forum, for example. Right. So. Um, Two benefits that I want to cover here about real-time facilitated discussion because it, it, it really hits two benefits on both sides, right, to the company and to uh, the, the community. So from the point of view of your company, it can help, like you, you mentioned, David, um, diffuse a potentially volatile situation or bring to light a home run success. From the point of view of your community, facilitated discussion allows their voice to be heard. Hey, they listen to me, which could be honestly, um, all the results that they need, right? And it can help you identify that data that you're looking for um, to help promote the good and, of course, dismantle the bad. <laughs> right. Okay, great. So let's talk about selecting a focus topic. Um, you, you know, you mentioned before applying a use case. In any of your social media, you've got to identify why would you use this and, and what is it that you're trying to achieve so that you can have some measurable results at the back end. Same goes with the facilitated discussion. You've got to punctuate it somehow and, and set the parameters against what it is that you're going to cover so that you know how to define success. Um, so once you identify a focus topic, you've got an objective for your facilitated discussion. How do you select a focus topic? You know, um, we've already covered a lot of this, right? So leverage that point of enthusiasm. What is it that sparks your community's interest? What is going on? Um, you know, and, and David, um, in your communities, you have the ability really to, to kind of sort and um, slice and identify what are the big buzz areas or what are people talking about? Yes? Yeah, definitely. And we even have, you know, as you're saying these things, I'm thinking of the parallel in community. We have the ability to pull out the most commented on, uh, you know, co uh, authors and, and things like that. So we can identify both the people that are creating the controversy and the topics that are creating controversy. By controversy, I just mean interest or enthusiasm. For sure, exactly. So you could you could leverage both of those types of, of um, ways to uh, identify what what is the point of interest or what is what is going on. What are what are the um, the areas of controversy, right? And then you choose those. Right? right. You get risky. It's all about the highest risk equals the highest reward. Safe topics just don't get attention, right. attendance or participation. Um, they don't touch that emotive hot button. That when if you, if you handle them effectively, um, it can yield the highest reward for you because um, it can get to some kind of resolution or some kind of celebration. So I suggest highly pick a hot topic, focus on it as an objective for the real-time virtual uh, discussion. So that's my my uh, homework for the audience is think about some hot topics that we need to cover that are gonna. Uh, get people on both sides of the fence <laughs> aiming at each other. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, uh, another good example or, or um, you know, we talked about focus groups and we talked about um, maybe a press, like a press conference. Uh, another type of um, way that you could frame it is, is like a town hall meeting on important topics in your community. Right. And um, with focus topics, and uh, facilitated discussion, there's a lot of difference in the amount of control that you have in this environment, right? David, you and I have a lot of control right now because we're the speakers. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm a speaker welcomed by content. But in, in uh, facilitated discussion, traditional presenters give, have to give up that control. They actually come to the table like everyone else to focus on the direction and outcome um, that, that's really ultimately up to the group. So um, it almost, but the uh, kind of think of the metaphor that's going to work out for it. So it, it, it becomes the, the focus topic becomes the objective that you put on the whiteboard. So if you're in a conference room or what have you and have, you have this big round table and 
you know, sometimes if it's an adversarial environment, you've got one side on the left and one side on the right, and they're duking it out. In a facilitated uh, discussion and dialogue, what happens is everyone starts to turn towards the whiteboard and the objective topic and starts to come together on one side of the table. So you truly begin to learn with and um, build an objective together instead of at adversarial. I Okay, good. So building engaging conversations, now that we've got a topic, how are we going to get the dialogue going? How are we going to keep it sustaining, and what is it going to do for us? So in order to build an engaging conversations, um, you want to start with that general topic and, and identify that general topic, but have, um, you know, before you get started, there's a lot of prep work that's involved, and some of that prep work includes identifying the specific points within the topic. Um, you can do that by uh, framing how you're going to relate to the topic and how you want to relate to the topic within that facilitated discussion. Um, what I like to do is I like to, to think about what is my rational aim, so what's, what's the point of this, what's the objective of, of the um, event, and what's the experiential aim? What is it that I would like my participants to experience, to come out with? Because those two are going to help you identify some specific types of points within the topic um, that you may want to discuss throughout the, the event. Like I said, keep the session small, 25 or less. Um, it's very difficult in an hour to be able to um, get to know uh, <laughs> more than 25 people. You know, you know if you start off first, I would say 12. Danny, you know what's interesting on that? Originally, I was thinking that would be a big liability, those low numbers, because, again, some of the WebExes we've done got, you know, giant numbers, and we've certainly got way more than 25 now. But I was actually looking at even some big news stories that people on Twitter were responding, and it almost seems like that is kind of a magic number where you see, you know, a couple of dozen people uh, ripping on, on the conversation specifically. Even though it might be a giant uh, activity, it almost seems like that's the kind of natural size a conversation can be before it just becomes a, you know, crazy stream of consciousness. So it's, it's funny how it works out. It does, yeah, it's a good point. Um, in, in group conversations, you can get to, you know, you don't have a lot of breadth, right? You don't have, like, the, the full reach of a, a large group audience, but you can get into a, a significant amount of depth with 25 or less. It's, it's very strange, but it is, it is very much that point of, of um, changing the group dynamic. So w once you're in the room, how do you how do you get people to go from individuals to a, a group and a team, if you will, um, quickly? Some of the things that you can do, you can do um, just like you would if you were in a face-to-face -face meeting or if you were in a group meeting, getting a bunch of individuals together first. I mean, what, David, what's the first thing you think of um, once you enter a room and there's a whole bunch of individuals? How do you get to know them? What's the first thing you might do? Try to introduce yourself, be the name badge. Okay. Yeah, maybe an activity to get to know people better, right? Yeah. So um, something quick that identifies, um, th that allows people to uh, demonstrate their identity, right? So you know, why are you here? Why is this? Why is this topic important to you specifically? And allowing every member, every participant in the group discussion to actually share through group voice, right? So. Um, handing them the phone or the microphone, literally going around the room and listening to every person um, within the room in, in a context. I mean, you have to frame it so that it doesn't pick up the entire hour, if you will, um, is, is really important because it warms up the group voice and you get a sense of who everyone is in the room because they're all a part of um, what the objective or outcome is. They all have a, a stake in the objective. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to jump out and facilitate it on your own, I think the number one suggestion that I can give is ask with the intent to listen, not the intent to respond. Um, when you're preparing for a real-time facilitated discussion, of course you want to come prepared with open-ended questions, but don't come with a prepared with a um, expected response or expected outcome because uh, the group really drives the event. It, it actually is a real live, um, something happens within the event that could never happen. Um, you know, it, it's the 
the sum is greater than the whole of its parts or the opposite. However, that <laughs> however that yeah. saying is, it's really true in a real time facilitated discussion. Yeah. So, um, how do you continue to build engaging conversations? Right? Um, you want to get voice and, and continue that that uh, everybody has a participation in here because if if you don't have if you have workers or people who aren't feeling like they're being heard or recognized, um, they're they're technically not a participant in a in a dialogue or a discussion. So you can use some useful tools here. I just put up a couple. These are a few of the tools that you can use in in programs like WebEx. In order so it's to perfect. Um, someone just asked that question. They said, you know, how how does this work from a user standpoint via phone and internet platform? So this is great. I think a lot of people again are used to WebEx just playing the screen. So. Yeah, you know, this is really interesting, right? So these panels that we have over on the right-hand side um, function very much like uh, order keepers. Um, it, it helps keep the order and create the container for how to keep the conversation going. Um, a lot of folks don't recognize that the participant panel is a huge tool that you can use because you can recognize who's talking. So if you look over there on the right, I have the ball, and there's some green stuff coming out of my, my headset, out of my phone over there. That means I'm talking, so you can recognize visually that um, it's Dana Bowler who's talking. And so when you're um, when you're having a facilitated discussion, you can call individuals by name and recognize and acknowledge the value of the information that they're sharing. So you can say, "Oh, you know, David, that is a great point. Thanks so much for sharing. I really appreciate that you um, you know wanted to share that with us." Right. Which you can't do in a phone conference because you don't recognize people's voices. You don't know who they are. Um, other tools like annotation tools, um, you can take notes, check opinions, and um, <clears throat> check against the group resolve. One of the big tools that I like to use is uh, the T over here, which is the text tool. I can keep track of some of the comments that are going on and um, start to build some kinds of uh, group um I guess resolve really is what it's all about. Uh, if, there, if there's a topic that I want to know, hey, how's everybody feeling about this? Or, hey, what is your one experience with this? I can use the text tool and annotation and actually ask everyone to annotate on the screen so that I can see everyone's responses in real time immediately up there on the board. And that helps identify some of the group resolve of, you know what? There's, you know, ten people in this in this group here who feel the exact same way. It's something that's a pretty big big deal, if you will. Um, and then, of course, the raise hand tool. Here's something that's very interesting and very. It's just a small thing, but a huge tool that that helps a ton when when you're trying to have a facilitated discussion in a, a web or virtual world as opposed to face to face. You can tell face to face if somebody wants to talk, right? They want to raise their hand or. Um, they're opening their mouth or leaning closer to you, and, and you don't get that um, experience in a, in a virtual world. But you do have a raise hand tool over here that you can use. And um, as a facilitator, I often use that and um, intro, set the context to say, okay, so when we're ready to have some dialogue and when we're ready to um, start to talk, if you've got something that you'd like to share, please raise your hand and I'll call on you. And so that sets a cadence so that people don't um, go into this interruption fear. I don't know if anybody's ever been on a conference call, but I have been on many, where um, somebody asks, hey, so um, anybody have any questions? And uh, no one answers because they think somebody else will answer, or they're afraid of talking over somebody else. So no one answers, and you get this, like, you get crickets, right? <laughs> right. So even now with the conference call, um, and you know there's a bit of a delay, you, you wait for a long pause before you jump in, Otherwise, the speaker won't hear you. Most of the conferencing tool or conferencing uh, phones will cut out the mic for a second. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, it's really about the, some of the additional best practices, if you will. Um, <laughs> so, you know, some of them include, hey, if you have a headset, that'll help with some of the delays. If you use a web conferencing tool or like a, a conference um, line or a speaker phone, it does. It does do some of those delays. So. Um, raising your hand is a, is a really great tool. You know, another two other tools, just the green check and the red X, is a is a great way to just identify consensus in the group. Hey, if you all agree, give me a green check. If you all disagree, give me a red X, and then you can immediately see the results of um, 
you know, who's in agreement and who's in disagreement. So building group involvement. Um, you know, there, there's a couple other examples of um, getting people involved and engaged. Um, one of the ways that I love to do it is, is literally going around the room and asking everyone's experience with the topic. I, I said that before, but using a specific facilitation method that's called ORID um, elicits the what, gut, so what, and now what for each of the individual members within the um, discussion so that you can get to the group resolve or now what do we do about it? We've, we've all talked about how we experienced it. What's the outcome? What's the resolve, right? And there's a lot of different types of resolve that you can um, identify. Um, resolutions can include, you know, hey, we decided that we're going to monitor the situation, or hey, we decided to um, build recommendations um, so that we can present those. Right. So, weaving the experience back into the community. Here are some just general ideas about how you might be able to take that punctuated real life discussion and um, outcome, whatever it is you have determined, right? Um, and be able to weave it back in. David, you mentioned posting the recorded event. Yep. Weaving what you guys decided back into the thread. Hey, we recommended a change in policy or we decided to do nothing and, and uh, monitor the situation. You can report on outcomes. So if there's some, some kind of actionable outcome that you guys decided to do, you can use that as a continuation of giving updates on progress. And you can also gather meta feedback on the experience. So get the, get the feedback from the participants in the real-time facilitated discussion, and then share those experiences out with the, with the community in the forum. So the those experiences goal, right? become a win. Say that again, David? That's some of the, okay, I didn't raise my hand, sorry. That's, that's some of the polling tools uh, that you can actually do live right in the site, right? You could do polling tools. You could even do a survey at the end. Right. If you publish that survey, then you can publish the results of that survey of how people, how group participants experience the event, if you will. It almost becomes a, hey, you know what? You, you spoke and we listened and um, here's what we did about it and here's how you felt about what we did about it. <laughs> I know we've, we've had conversations on a couple of different things, so you know, now we're kind of talking about marketing and a few other things, but this is, this is just another form of e-learning too, right? Where you're going to test people's, you know, what they thought or what they knew beforehand and, and what they thought or what they know afterwards. You know, I, I, I just know having talked to a lot of e-learning people and e-marketing, they sound really different. They're really, they're really not that different in terms of just being communication skills. Oh, absolutely. I think um, in, in every type of uh, communication or interaction that you have, there's a bit of e-marketing and a bit of e-learning that, that you um, should, should do. Uh, you know, there's best practices that, that run the gamut through both of those um, differentiated, you know, groups, if you will. Um, we're always constantly learning and we're always constantly marketing ourselves. And it's the same in uh, a virtual environment, right? Um, how, how do you keep the buzz going and how do you keep the learning going so that everything continues to evolve over time? Mm -hmm. yeah. And then, you know, from our, go ahead. Oh, no, go ahead. I was going to say, you know, from our perspective, that is, um, that is why we, we taught the clients about doing this. So these communities don't just build momentum and it's really hard to get momentum in a community and that is a conversation that goes on without you. So if every one of these events or points of enthusiasm creates a bump in membership or a bump in participation, and it may not stay at that level because obviously there's a lot of excitement going on, but if the result afterward is, you know, a 10% higher, then you're contributing to this momentum of the community and you're, you're highlighting who the thought leaders are in different spaces and you're highlighting the topics that move the community, then that just keep that just adds momentum to, you know, what you're really trying to get going in the community in the first place. Absolutely. And then you can leverage that as your point of experience, right, of, of learning how to do it next time to continue that momentum. Because it's not just a, a one point in time, hey, I'm going to do this and then our community is going to, um, you know, be all a flutter and, and uh, very live and active. 
it, it helps you understand uh, from your community's culture what they respond to versus what they don't. You right. know, because every culture community is, is different. And that's what I, and I'd love if the audience could, you know, when you're sharing feedback and things, share your ideas on how to keep the buzz going. Obviously, the easy one, you know, post the asset and allow comments. But, but everything from follow-up events and how you treat people and, and how you reply to people that participate. I'm looking at the Twitter conversations and thinking about the dialogue that I want to engage in after this to follow up with some of those people. So I'm sure everybody on the line has some great examples. So by all means, you know, share them back on Twitter or email them into us and, We'll just keep this whole topic moving forward. Absolutely. I would love to hear some additional ideas of, of how it might help my work in other communities because it, it, it always is just a little different based yeah. on that culture. Great. I'm looking forward to that. Hey, do you want to grab the ball back? I will put the ball back and we'll wrap this up. We're, we're just a little bit over time, but uh, we just a little bit to wrap up today. So, you know, we show these things and they're kind of neat, but people don't know really where to go from there. Um, we didn't really show anything that you couldn't do today. We didn't show any technology that's, you know, future technology that's going to come in a few months. I did show a few mock-ups on how you might sort of position that seminar moving forward, but that's all stuff we could do inside current templates. So, you know, if, if you have a community today and you want to integrate what we talked about with the synchronous events, that is the WebEx uh, side of things, uh, Dana has shared an email address that you can contact to, to get in touch with us. In other words, you don't have to be an awareness client to do this. WebEx is a great product, works in a lot of different environments. If you haven't even started on a community and you want to sort of get right to business with the whole community and how we would integrate WebEx, then by all means contact us through the contact form on our website. So that's www.awarenessnetworks.com slash company slash contact. Or just put, go to our website and look for the contact link. And we'd be happy to get someone to call you back and, and connect with that. Now, these sessions, they all overlap a lot, but, you know, we're going to be doing a whole bunch of uh, sessions. Um, and, uh, Mike, maybe you want to talk to us? Yeah, I think it'd be now. great. Uh, this is Mike again. Uh, just want to real quickly, one last sales pitch from, from, uh, from Awareness. Uh, we have set, the, set, the upcoming session is coming from actually Awareness, not WebEx. Uh, our next one is next week with Jason Ball. If you don't know Jason, um, Really smart guy. I believe his blog is uh, socialmediaexpert.com or something along those lines. Uh, he works for uh, Joe Anderson down in, in uh, Louisville, Kentucky, and has spent his whole career working with agencies. And actually, the title of the section that he just got is Social Media. Your marketing agency doesn't get it. Who does? Uh, so it should be a really informative one for those in the line. Those of you who know Brian Solis, he just came out with a book, uh, Putting the Public Back in Public Relations, another great session. And Adam Broidman, who just started his own uh, advertising agency circuit, a lot of experience in social media, uh, is going to be with us July 30th. Finally, for those of you that are going to be in Boston next week, if anybody on the line is coming to Enterprise 2.0, we'd love to invite you to a party we're having. Uh, to tweet up on June 23rd, that's Tuesday night, starts at 6.30 p.m., Anyone interested can uh, just either DM me on uh, Twitter, that's Boston Mike on Twitter, or you can um, uh, you can look it up on Facebook uh, under Enterprise 2.0, uh, or you can just drop me an email, mike.lewis at awarenessnetworks.com. We'll be happy to get you signed up. Um, so with that, I'd like to thank both David and Dana for their time today, and thank especially everybody on the line who, who joined us. There will be both a recording, slides, and a podcast of this made available early next week, so give us a couple of days to convert everything and edit down all the oohs and ahs and stuff like that and, and get everything prepped and ready to go. But we really do appreciate your time. Thanks for joining us and hope you can make it.